Well, good morning. Awesome. A lot, lot of awake people in the room this morning. All of you should be more awake than me. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Chris. I'm the youth pastor here at Orlando Christian Church. I have the opportunity to host the Food Olympics tonight, and uh, it's going to be epic. Uh, we do ask that your student bring an extra shirt, but uh, other than that, just know that they're going to probably come back a little bit messier tonight. It's all right. Uh, but I stayed up as the youth pastor. I feel like my job is um, to make sure that I relate to the students. And so one of the things that I have to do just because it's in my job is uh, binge Netflix. <laughs> and um, so for the, those of you that watch Stranger Things, um, I watched all of it. And I was up till 3 o'clock this morning. And I told Matt after the service that I'd, I'd watch an entire episode, and then I'd, I'd work on my message. And then I'd watch an episode, and I'd work on my message. So I felt like I was double dipping. I was, I was equally ministering to the students and prepping for this morning. So I'm a little tired, but I'm excited because God's got a great word this morning, and I, I can't wait to share it with you guys. I have an awesome family. If you don't know anything about my family, um, I have a beautiful wife uh, named Renee and uh, two awesome children. There they are. Uh, Aiden is six, and Allie just turned three, which is which is pretty ridiculous, to be honest with you. And um, I remember when Aiden was born, our firstborn child. Um, if you remember the, when your firstborn child came, it's a bit of a panic attack, a bit of a, a, an un, unnerving nature uh, to it. And Aiden was no different. Renee woke up the morning that Aiden was born and just said, oh, you know what, I have a, a little bit of pain. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go to work. So I went to work. And, uh, well, I wasn't feeling any pain. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? I, I was fine. And so I went to, I went to work, and I uh, did my, well, Renee set up an appointment for about 2 o'clock that afternoon, so I left work, and I went out to the appointment, and the doctor's like, uh, you're five centimeters dilated, you should probably head to the hospital. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, baby's coming. Uh, and so we got to the hospital, we waited, and uh, Aiden uh, was not a very forthcoming child, and uh, Renee got to the point where she had to kind of push the baby out, and we pushed for uh, two hours. Oh, if we. She pushed for two hours. I got to make sure I'm careful there. I'll get in trouble later. So she pushed for two hours, and uh, baby didn't come. And so the doctor came in. He's like, look, baby's the wrong way. And, of course, if you know our son, um, that's pretty normal. And so <laughs> baby's turned the wrong way. We can go in there and try to, like, suck him out. Or, you know, we can do a C-section. Renee was exhausted, and so we decided to do a C-section. Being somebody who's never had surgery or a broken bone or in the hospital before, surgeries are a bit um, panicky for me in that moment. Like, first of all, my wife is going in. And outside of TV, I've never seen anything like this before. So this is really unnerving for me. It's a bit of a panic attack for me, right? 18 months after Aiden was born, I lost my job. Renee wasn't working at the time. So we have an 18-month-old baby. I have a wife I'm supposed to provide for, and I have no money. It's in that moment, right, where you go, oh, crap. Like, I have, I have nothing. I, I, you know, and a lot of us, maybe you are in that position this morning where you go, I don't have any hope for what's coming. We live in a world oftentimes where our hope is taken from us. And so I want to share a passage this morning. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to flip open to Matthew 24. The message this morning is a call to hope. And the question that I want to answer is this. How do we find hope? In hopelessness. How do we find hope in hopelessness? So if you, have a, if you don't have a Bible, I'd love for you to grab the one in front of you in the chair. It's page 1121, Matthew chapter 24. And if you don't have a Bible, just take that one with you. Write your name in it. Scribble in it this morning. We're going to have a lot of fun as we work through the text, but I just want that to be your Bible. So Matthew chapter 24, we're going to start in verse 3. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit. We'll go. So it says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen? Now, outside of context, this doesn't make too much sense. So let me give you a little context. What these guys are asking is, prior to this passage, Jesus has been talking about a couple of of really important things, like the end times, like when everything is going to end. And so in Matthew 23, he gives these seven woes to the religious leaders and the Pharisees of the day. And then right before this passage, he talks about how Jerusalem will be judged for their actions and that the temple, their sacred place, 
will be destroyed. And so up to this point, it's been a really negative feel. And so the disciples are going, when? When's all this going to happen? And Jesus answers them in verse 4. He says, watch out that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will mislead many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Make sure that you are not alarmed for this must happen. But the end is still to come. For nation will rise up in arms against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted and will kill you. You will be hated by all the nations because of my name. And then many will be led into sin and they will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Because lawlessness will increase so much, the love of many will grow cold. So there's not too much hope here. <laughs> Christian didn't really pick a good passage. I agree. It was a tough one. I want to show a couple reasons why we shouldn't have hope to start. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says, watch out that no one misleads you, right? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. So one of the reasons why we shouldn't have hope is because we're going to be deceived, Deception is coming. Now, oftentimes, if we were to read this and we were to say, people will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, you might think of guys like Jim Jones or David Koresh, guys who came and said, I am the second coming of Jesus, and they got these multitudes of people to come and to follow them and lead them astray. But I think Satan has a, a different way sometimes of equally attacking us. And that comes through doubt in who God is. That God exists. It comes through blaming God for things that have happened in our lives. It comes uh, also probably through a misunderstanding of who God is. That when God doesn't give us everything that we want, that somehow God isn't God. So he says, be careful, don't be deceived. Verses 6 through 8, he says, of all these things, this tribulation that's coming, right? Look at verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. A nation will rise up in arms against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes and various places. I mean, this, this is not a very happy place. He's saying these trials and tribulations are going to come. And he doesn't say this so that we try to guess when the end of the world is coming, but rather to prepare for it. If you want to make a quick buck, a good option for you is to write a book and say the world will end in 2020. Everybody will buy it. We'll build shelters, we'll buy food, and we'll all bunker down and wait for the end of the world. And Jesus here is saying, uh-uh, no, 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 no. The end of the world is not coming like that. He's not telling us we can guess the end of time. He's telling us so we can prepare for how we're going to act in those times. We'll come back to that, don't worry. Verse 9, persecution's coming, right? Why else should we have hope? They will hand you over to be persecuted and will kill you. Be hated by all the nations just because of his name. That's interesting to me. And for us, it's a foreign concept, right? Many of you are not dealing with persecution right now. The fact that you're sitting in this room actually tells me that all of us are not dealing with persecution right now. We have this cool thing called freedom of religion. But most countries, apart from America, a lot of them don't. They don't have the freedom. They're already being persecuted. And church, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think it's far off that we will be as well. And I believe that there will be a vetting of the church where people who actually have to decide whether or not they're going to follow Christ or not will be taken out. Persecution is coming. The question is not when. The question is not if, but when. Look at verses 10 through 12. It's this idea of temptation, right? Many will be led into sin and they will betray one another and hate one another. False prophets will appear and deceive many because of lawlessness will increase so much the love of many will grow cold. This one, oftentimes, it shows itself in this, the temptation to kind of shove God to the corner and believe that it's, it's you. It's all about me. 
And oftentimes in this, this will drive many, or maybe it's driven you or, or your children, to walk away from the faith. You'll be like, you know what? This thing is done. I'm out. This God thing is a load of garbage. You shake your fist at God. But the text doesn't say that God's the one doing it, does it? Verse 10 says they were led into sin. And God is not sin. Let me tell you also a piece of hope for you parents this morning who are struggling with kids who may have walked away from the faith. Sin has been defeated. And we rest in the hope that Jesus is greater than all of that. So if I stopped there, we'd all be pretty disappointed. Let me keep going. In America alone, I want you to look at some really detrimental statistics. In America, each year, there are 4,000 deaths due to domestic violence, just in America. 10,000 deaths due to drunk driving, 15 due to gun violence, uh, 43,000 due to suicide, which is the fastest growing death rate currently. And among the age group that I have the opportunity to minister to, it is the fastest growing. It's an epidemic, similar to drug abuse, drug overdose, 64,000 a year. If we looked at America, we are in a dark place. Hate and bigotry, pornography, drug abuse, these are the themes of America. And so if I said goodbye, have a great week, we would all leave disappointed, frustrated, hopeless. But we do have hope. We do have hope. I want to draw your eyes back to the text for a second. Look back at verse 6. I want to show you something that, that we might have missed. You will hear of wars and rumors of war, but check this out. Make sure that you are not alarmed. Some of your rivals might say frightened or afraid. Make sure that you are not panicking. Why? Why would Jesus throw this in the midst of this? Wars and, and anger and all aggression is coming against. And yet he says, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't freak out. Why? Because of verse 8. Look at verse 8. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Now, I've never experienced birth pains. Nope, not firsthand at least. I've experienced the grasp of birth pains. <laughs> All right? But personally, I've never experienced birth pains. Now, there, uh, there is a great YouTube video, if you're bored and you want to go online and check it out, of uh, men who actually uh, strapped on, like, sensors and had uh, contractions and stuff done to their stuff. And it's, uh, it's incredible. Uh, they're writhing in pain on the floor, so kudos to women. Now, birth pains, um, I'm glad I don't have to experience them. But even though they're often constituted with a negative connotation, right? Like birth pains are never like, I can't wait! woo labor! <laughs> At least I don't think so. But there's semblance of delivery. Verse 8 is hope. It says, this is the beginning of your deliverance. Ooh. So, don't panic. Don't be afraid. Why? Because your deliverance is coming. Look at verse 13. But the person who endures to the end will be saved. So why should we not panic? Because our deliverance is coming. How do we know? Because if we endure to the end, we will be saved. When we look at hope, I want to define it for you. I want to define what true hope is. Because often hope is associated with an emotion or a feeling or a circumstance or a situation. But I would attest that hope is not found in any of those things. That hope is found only in Jesus. Hope is found in Jesus. So I want to look at three quick things this morning to give us hope. Where do we find hope? In the midst of a hopeless world, where do we find hope? First thing I would say is that hope is in forgiveness. Look at Matthew 24, 13. It says, but the person who endures to the end will be saved. If you've been saved, you've been forgiven. 
Jesus has forgiven you of all the things you have done. A question I get more often than not is, how many times will Jesus forgive me? Students are classic for asking this question. How many times can I do something before God stops forgiving me? Uh, I don't think we're asking the right question. Right? I don't think the question should be, how many times can I get away with something, right? A uh, classic bank robber question. How many banks can I rob before I know it's the last one? Like, uh, probably the one where you get arrested, right? Rome where it catches up with me. So, I think we're asking the wrong question. Uh, think about it like this. My kids, Aiden and Allie, uh, love each other sometimes and hit each other sometimes. Now, every time that one of them hits the other one, it's always back and forth. Like, Aiden will hit Allie, Allie will hit Aiden, Aiden normally cries, Allie normally walks away. Like, it's super good. It's fine. It's, he's just sensitive. And so in that moment, right, I could go, you know what, Aiden, that hit was the last one. I no longer forgive you. Now that's not, I mean, we all know that's stupid, right? I'm always going to forgive my children, regardless of what they do. I will always forgive them. They're my, they're my child. Now the consequences, that's a word we don't like. The consequences will still be there. I like to think of that like this. If I forget our wedding anniversary, which is May 29, 2010. <laughs> She's in the room, so i got to make sure I'm on my game. If I forget our wedding anniversary, my wife will forgive me. She will. But the consequences, they're still there. And she'll attest to that. I haven't forgotten it yet. We're seven years in. I, I want to I leave you kind of in, in this idea with a statement that I came up with that I think is helpful. If God did not want to forgive you, then he would not have sent Jesus to die for you. This, is, this has changed my life. Because often I think God can't forgive me for what I've done. But if you're a Christian this morning, Jesus has already forgiven you for things that you don't even know you've done. Or that you're going to do. And we hold our hope in that forgiveness. Secondly, not only do we hold hope in forgiveness, but we find hope in the gospel. Look at verse 14. It says, In this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole inhabited earth as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. That's important. Then the end will come. Verse 8, these are all birth pains, but the delivery ain't happening. If you want to write a book about the end of times, it won't make you a lot of money, It'll only be one page long, but this is what it should say. Jesus will come back when the gospel has been preached to all nations. He says it multiple times. It's not, but everything's getting bad, Chris. Awesome. 2,000 people groups haven't heard the gospel. It ain't ending yet. Jesus tells us the end of time will come, not when things get really bad, but when the gospel has been proclaimed. If you are a Christian, your opportunity and responsibility is to take the gospel to the nations. Now, God has become so uh, frustrated probably with America that he said, you know what, since America doesn't want to go, I will bring the nations to you. And if you live in this area, D.C., Baltimore, this whole area, you will recognize that if you walk out of your neighborhood, you walk through your streets, go to your restaurants, go to the places where you go, the nations are there. And it is our opportunity that God has given us to proclaim the gospel to them. If we find hope in the gospel, let me give you this line, and I'm going to tell you a story. Finding hope in the gospel means that we count our lives as nothing in comparison to the hope that we will receive. Let me share with you a couple of stories from the persecuted church that will hopefully be helpful in this. Nagasaki, Japan, 16th century. 26 Christians are captured and are set to be executed. Two of them are a father and a son. The son writes home to his mother before his execution, and this is what he says. Mother, we are supposed to be crucified tomorrow in Nagasaki. Please do not worry about anything, because we will be waiting for you to come to heaven. Oh, man. Everything in this world vanishes like a dream. Be sure you never lose the happiness of heaven, the hope of heaven. Be patient and show love to many. You find hope in the gospel 
and not in your circumstances. That is when you can truly live. England in the 19th century, I told the students this story a couple weeks back. There was a revival that broke out in Wales, England in the 19th century. Out of that came a missionary family who went to Africa to preach the gospel. They preached the gospel, to, and finally, after months of labor, one family comes to faith in Christ. They go back and tell the tribal chief who hires headhunters to come out to capture that family and to bring them back to them. They place them on their knees with bows perched back. And they say, if you do not recant, if you do not say that this is all a lie, we will kill your sons in front of you. The man looks back at the tribal chief. He says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And they kill his sons in front of him. They turn the bows to his wife. And they say, if you do not recant, we will kill your wife. He says, though none go with me, Still, I will follow. No turning back. They kill his wife. They finally place the bow directly at him. And they look at him and they tell him one last time, if you do not recant, it will kill you. He says, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. And they killed him. Out of that testimony, the tribal chief and many others, because of his faith, came to believe in Jesus. They took his words, his final words, and created an African hymn that now is translated into America. And we sing this hymn. If you have ever heard it before, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Modern day Asia and the Middle East, some of the most tumultuous areas in our world of religious persecution Many are fearful of their lives, being placed in labor camps, imprisoned. And yet, the Middle East and Asia are two of the fastest growing Christian populations in the world. When you have hope in the gospel, your life cannot be changed. Your life will be changed. And Jesus cannot be stopped. But I look at this and I, I see that above all else, we can have hope in forgiveness, we can have hope in the gospel, but above all else, we must have our hope rooted in Jesus. Jesus gives us hope because he knows what's coming. And hope is often misunderstood. Hope is often thought of a wishful thinking of the future. Like, I hope I get that thing. But you need hope, not because of the future, but you need hope because you got to wake up tomorrow and live. Rick Warren said it like this. He said, uh, hope is not optimism. Optimism is psychological. Hope is theological. Optimism is personal trust in yourself, and hope is personal trust in God. Optimism is what you think you can do, and hope is what you think God can do. Because some of us this morning are just thinking that if we just have enough positive thoughts that we'll make it through. But optimism is positive thinking. Hope is a personal commitment to Jesus. Some of you this, this year have lost your jobs. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you or a friend of yours has, has gotten some sort of disease this year. You've received bad news. I mean, maybe for you, you lost a loved one or something terrible in your life has happened. A business has fallen apart. And this morning you're looking at me going, I don't have hope. I'm lost and I don't know what to do. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yesterday I was sitting, uh, not paying too much attention to my kids because they often do their own thing. And I was sitting on the chair studying this and looking at this and my daughter dragged out her crib, she loves baby dolls, so she drags out her crib, she sets it down next to me, and she sits on the floor next to me, and she's playing with her baby and having a good time. I'm just watching her, laughing, feeding that fake bottle to her. And then I hear something distinctly out of 
my ear. And it's my daughter. She's praying over this baby doll. <laughs> and it's super sweet. That gives me hope. Because I know that Jesus is working in her life. And I know that Jesus can work in yours as well. My daughter's three. She doesn't know all of the deep theological truths of the Bible, but she knows that Jesus can help. And my hope this morning is that you'll stop turning to money or drugs or friendships or career. You'll stop turning to your health or your house or your marriage. And this morning that you'll say, I want to find my hope in something that is concrete, that is secure, and that is Jesus. He's calling out for you this morning. The question is, are you going to respond to him? I want to give you guys an opportunity this morning to do that. Maybe this morning you need to find your hope and forgiveness. But for some of us this morning, in order for us to find hope and forgiveness, we have to forgive somebody else. Maybe you're holding on to bitterness and you go, I can't forgive them for what they've done. And this morning you need, you need to forgive somebody so that you can genuinely find hope and forgiveness that Jesus wants to give to you. Maybe this morning you need to find your hope in the gospel. You need to come down and say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus and nothing else. No turning back. Maybe this morning, maybe it's a next step that you need to take. Maybe you've been afraid of what people would think if you came forward and said, I need to be baptized. If you came forward and said, I need, I need Jesus, I need this. Like, maybe for you, it's just the boldness to take the next step. I want to challenge you this morning to step out in faith and to believe that Jesus is greater because he wants to have a relationship with you. If he didn't, he wouldn't have come. He would have been continually lost without hope. But instead, he gave us hope. So if that's you this morning, I'm going to provide an opportunity for you to respond. We're going to sing a song. And if that's you this morning, our prayer team is going to be up front. Pastors are going to be up front. If you need Jesus, if you need to be baptized, we'll do it this morning. We've got clothes for you. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Why? Because this is the beginning of your deliverance this morning. Will you pray with me? Jesus, be in this place. Jesus, be over each one of these people this morning. Give them boldness and courage to step out in faith. Jesus, we know that you are here. We know that you are present. We know that your spirit is working. So God, I pray over each one of these individuals this morning. God, I call them out to come down front this morning, God, in your name. Jesus, that they would be saved this morning. That they would take that next step this morning. That they would seek deliverance this morning. That they would find their hope in you this morning. So God, as we stand, as we sing, I pray for boldness and courage in this place this morning. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you come?